The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Teek said it's, uh, we're going to have three presentations today transitioning from aspects of the patient to the clinician. So my portion today is going to talk about patients in the ICU and thinking about the alarmscape that they're exposed to. The learning objectives today, um, which you can read here, we will go through in that order. No conflicts of interest. When you think about the hospital, it's obviously a loud place. It's that way for patients. It's that way for clinicians. Think about when you go home and you hear the beeping of the pulse ox in your head or the alarms. But also think of the patients who are laying in bed exposed to these alarms, be it the patient monitor or infusion pump, and it wakes them up from sleep. They don't sleep well. They can get ICU delirium, long-term cognitive impairment. So just the fact that we get them out of the hospital alive isn't necessarily good enough. As a quick background of how I got into this, obviously I trained here as one of the B.H. Robbins scholars, but my background before all that is in music. Uh, some of you don't know, uh, my undergraduate degree is in jazz piano performance from Loyola, New Orleans, and I'm actually in a faculty band uh, comprised of all engineering faculty, and we're called VIBE, the Vanderbilt Initiative of Biofunky Engineers. So I encourage you to check out our YouTube videos. When you think of the alarms effects on staff, you can just think of yourself, how you're working a long time in the OR and the ICU. You feel fatigued, you have struggle with communication. You might misinterpret uh, communicative cues between you and the surgeon or other clinicians, other ICU doctors. You feel burnt out, especially with working hard during COVID. Headaches, you go home and you're just simply worn out. So noise levels throughout the hospital, but especially in the ICU are high. Think about when you're rounding during the morning and besides the speaking of the different teams, you have family members, doors opening and closing, and those are even non-alarm sounds. So you add alarms to the milieu of the noise exposure and it's starting to really affect patients. One of the studies we just submitted a grant for yesterday is to examine just that, is, is this noise exposure an independent risk factor for neuropsychological and cognitive outcomes? We have a concept of alarm fatigue, which is really more of a colloquial definition. There's not an operational definition, but think of how you feel, the, the stress, the burnout, as I said in that first slide, we're exposed to a huge number of alarms, up to 700 alarms per day. The Emergency Care Research Institute identified alarm hazards as the number one health technology hazard starting in 2012 and continuing that way throughout. When you think of alarms, also the, it has a terribly poor positive predictive value the false alarm rate approaches 99%. Think of other high consequence industries like aviation. If a pilot's flying and they hear an alarm to pull up because they're going at too steep of an angle towards the ground or too fast, that has about 100% positive predictive value of being a real alarm. So as we have these false alarms, we don't trust them. When we don't trust them and we realize they're non-actionable, we may not respond to them. Think of the patient, what is their perception of care if the clinician is not responding to the alarm. We may realize it's not an acute alarm that we need to respond to, but do they perceive the care's quality? Besides perception, how is it interrupting their sleep if we let non-acute alarms just sound and sound as we may be busy in other patient rooms? So why don't we just put earplugs in the patients or eye shades on the patients? Well, that might be fine for a transatlantic flight, which we really have lost memory of what that feels like lately, but that can be delirogenic. So that may be a short-term solution and papers have looked at that, but that's not an, uh, a tenable long-term solution for patient exposure to the alarmscape. My research group in the Netherlands at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam is actually looking at what's called a silent ICU. They say, well, why do patients even need to be exposed to alarms in the first place? If the perception of care is bad and the positive predictive value is so poor, why do they need to hear this? Why do they need the sleep deprivation? So what we developed with my engineering team a few years ago is how can we take the patient alarms out of the patient experience? Clinicians have silenced alarms, which would silence it across the entire hospital, the entire clinical landscape. 
But that has led to bad outcomes. The FDA MAW database has found over 500 patient deaths in that period from 2005 to 2012 from alarm mismanagement. So we developed a device and published about it and presented it at the International Conference for Auditory Display. And this device was featured in CNN Health. And what it is as a prototype of the device to give you an idea is it uses a Raspberry Pi interface, samples the auditory environment in the room and is going to digitally extract out the alarm signal for the patient. But again, when we do this, we don't want to interrupt other environmental stimuli. That would be the same reason why eye shades or earplugs would be bad for the patient. So we looked at the alarm spectra and Allie's going to get into this uh, in her portion of the presentation, but you can see the alarm frequencies on the left panel that are circled. This is the red alarm on the Philips patient monitor. You can see the fundamental at 960 Hertz and the second harmonic, which is the offensive harmonic, if you will, at the critical bandwidth at 2,880 Hertz. We wanted to, based on the alarm spectra and those narrow critical bandwidths, be able to digitally extract them out you can see on the right panel, we were able to do that. Notice the different units on the y-axis. The speech frequencies flirt with these harmonics and fundamental of the alarm. What that means is if we digitally extract out the alarm, we don't want to affect speech. If we affect speech and it sounds robotic or non-natural, we were worried that that could be delirogenic. So we want to ensure not only from a digital spectral standpoint can we do it, but what about the end user human factors standpoint of speech perception? So we did what's called a consonant nucleus consonant test, which is in the hearing and speech validated paradigms, which looks at words phonemes. So that's taking a single syllable word and looking at the full word, but the phoneme is the aspect of the sounds of the syllable. So for example, goose, you have the full word, but you have the phonemes of goo and s. And so this was done in the presence and absence of the alarm filtering. So these were our results. And as you can see, the phoneme score and the word score, both in the unfiltered alarm in both of those, it improved the percent correct. We just wanted to make sure we did not make speech worse. But in fact, as you can see, we improved speech comprehension by filtering the alarm. So it's you would say, well, yes, taking the alarm out of the environment should help. But remember this which was digital subtraction of the alarm we improve speech comprehension in that we did not harm it at all. So when you do things, how does it affect how we practice medicine in the alarmscape? How do we impart change? The international standard of alarms is, comes from the International Electrotechnical Commission and the standard is 60601-1-8. If you are having trouble sleeping, it's a great 168 page PDF for you to read. But importantly, as Pratik said at the beginning of the introduction, and this is going to lead into Ali's presentation, is our work that Ali is going to present, especially our work in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, inform the new revision of the standard. This came out in July of this year, July of 2020. And so instead of just a journal publication behind a paywall read by academic physicians, this is now published as an international standard that even though there's not standard police per se, when companies start to design devices, it's to their best interest to follow the standard. And it's really informed by evidence more so than any other previous iterations of the standard. You can see the two citations I included here. So leading into that, when we think of standards of alarms, I'm gonna turn it over to my research colleague, Ali, to discuss our work and background that led into this. So as Joe said, with a surplus of research showing the effects of alarm fatigue and the problems with clinicians being exposed to a large number of alarms, we've seen that the constant sounds of alarms are negatively impacting clinician performance, whether that's communication, beeping noises, music, or other sounds that you can hear in the hospital or operating room, there is a need for research to be done in this field. As Joe said, the United States Emergency Care Research Institute identifies alarms as one of the top 10 safety hazards, warning that clinicians can become overwhelmed, distracted, and desensitized to, through a phenomenon called alarm fatigue. Physicians and staff can be exposed to up to 700 alarms per day. Research has also identified problems that stem from alarms acoustic design. Research has demonstrated that 72 to 99% of clinical alarms are false. With this, 
The Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goal was to reduce harm associated with clinical alarm systems, highlighting the need to manage the number of alarms, signals, and their noise. So we had two phases of our study that we did. So in phase one of our study, we tested the conventional alarm that is currently used in hospitals and varied the noise to level of the alarm relative to background noise, which is known as signal to noise ratio, while participants completed three simultaneous tasks. So through a robust experimental paradigm in an anechoic environment to study human response to audible alerting stimuli in a cognitively demanding setting, akin to high tempo, high risk domains, clinician participants responded to patient crises while concurrently completing an auditory speech intelligibility task and a visual vigilance distracting task, as well as the levels of alarms were being varied as signal to noise ratios, um, above and below the hospital background noise, which will be described later. So the experiment was done in the anechoic chamber, you can see here in the picture. And an anechoic chamber is a room designed to completely absorb reflections of either sound or electromagnetic waves. They are also often isolated from waves entering their surroundings. So this ensures that sound levels can be controlled and accurate. So this is our experimental paradigm here. So there was three different tasks that the participant was instructed to complete. And they were told to respond to all three of these tasks with equal urgency. So as you can see, the participant sits here in the middle of the room facing the visual distracting task. And then I wanted to point out that these small black boxes around the circle are where the noise is emitted from. So first I'm gonna speak about the visual um, vigilance task. So right here, visual distraction task. And that's a measured response to the yellow LED light. So the participants were told to press a key on the keyboard whenever the yellow LED light was turned off. So next I'm gonna talk about the clinical task, which you can see here where it says clinical stimulus. So this is, this is like stimulating a patient monitoring system in the hospital. So patients were told that there was five different emergency events and corresponding vital signs would show up on the visual display showing physiological values such as diastolic and systolic blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, and blood oxygen levels. The participant was told to select the drug that would be suitable for treating the condition in question and was expected to respond to each emergency event using the labeled keys on the keyboard, four drugs corresponding to one or two events. So the third task I'm gonna talk about is reflected here in the slide. That's the coordinate response measure, also known as the CRM task which is outlined here um, that shows a speech intelligibility task. So participants were told to listen for ready and a call sign. So here are some of the examples. So they were told to listen, for example, ready, alpha, go to a color followed by a number. So ready, alpha, go to blue, six. Then the participants would press the corresponding buttons on the keyboard. So they'd press blue and then six. So I thought it was important to highlight that the CRM was developed by the Air Force for multi-talker displays. So it was developed for fighter pilots when they are flying and they can hear a lot of voices through the radios um, in an airplane and they have to discern who the target is and who they need to listen to instead of other people that are talking through the radio. So for me personally, being a pilot, I know how important it is to make sure you are able to hear air traffic control personnel that are speaking, specifically when they're speaking to you, because over the radio, there can be many people speaking at once. But when you are given a signal from the air traffic control, you have to make sure you hear them, because if you don't, it can be dangerous and a lot of people can get hurt. So we decided to use the CRM because of the similarities between anesthesiology and aviation. For example, a safety checklist, a culture of safety, and the conduct of anesthetic. So putting a patient to sleep is similar to take off in an airplane and waking a patient up is similar to landing. So now I'm going to present data results from phase one in order to set up phase two that we're going to discuss later. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the results on phase one, but you can read um, the journal article in the Journal of Acoustical Society of America paper to find out more. So as you can see here, this slide shows accuracy and alarm signal to noise in terms of the clinical task accuracy. And this shows the accuracy is still maintained until negative 11 decibels, which is still softer than background noise. And this shows that auditory alarms can be set at minimum levels of audibility with no deterrent to performance. So I wanted to point out here that current alarms are up here in the positive SNR range. 
and that alarms here in the very negative SNR range are always inaudible. So now in this slide, we have mean response time and alarm signal to noise in terms of the clinical task. And these results look pretty similar. So the response times were maintained again until negative 11 decibels. And then the amount of time it took a participant to respond went up from there. So as you can see here on the slide, the odds of correctly addressing the clinical task were smaller by 30% when there was a concurrent CRM task. So this means that when you were doing another task besides completing the clinical task, the accuracy that you had in those tasks were decreased. So now here we're gonna look into the CRM tasks and the accuracy and signal to noise that are involved there. So you, this slide doesn't only show the alarms should be, could be softer than background noise from a clinical performance standpoint, but it also arguably shows that they should be because performance worsens, as you can see here, when they are louder than background noise. So when the signal to noise ratio near the positive SNRs here, the tasks were significantly worse. And this figure provides an example for audibility to interpret speech with speech intelligibility and shows that accuracy was much worse at positive SNRs. Additionally, when looking at mean response time and alarm to, to noise to signal noise in the CRM task, you could see that at positive signals to noise ratios, response time also got slower. And although the accuracy data may be more impressive and more important than misunderstood speech, the response time is still very important because it can lead to morbidity and mortality. So as these results showed, the likelihood of addressing the CRM task at all, so whether the clinician heard the alarm or did not hear the alarm, significantly worsened when there was also a clinical task or a vigilance task at the same time. And there was also evidence that alarm levels affect the likelihood of correctly addressing the CRM task at all. So Joe spoke about this a little before, but I wanted to highlight this and go over this. So the figure here shows the alarm spectra at 11 decibels lower than background noise. And this is why you can still perceive an alarm that is softer than background noise, because as you can see here, the critical bandwidth, which is a harmonic at 2,281 hertz, pierces the noise floor, so you're still able to hear, perceive a lower sounding alarm. So I wanted to show this device that the Schlesinger lab developed, and this device can dynamically change the alarm output for optimal signal to noise ratio. This is called DASH and stands for Dynamic Alarm Systems for Hospitals, and this device has been patented. So to recap, before I start speaking about phase two, in phase one of the study, we found that in order to be successful in directing attention, alarms must be loud enough to be heard, and thus the signal to noise ratio deciphered, distinguishable from the external scene, and must be easy to learn the meanings in order to relieve cognitive burdens. So in phase two of our study, we followed the same methods as the JASA paper, but we also added music, which was volume normalized, non-lyrical, meaning it contained no words, and we also added the novel auditory icon alarm, which we compared to the conventional alarm, which was used in phase one. An auditory icon alarm consists of an auditory icon and a pointer that are played together. A pointer can be best understood as a short pulse of sound consisting of five harmonics. The rhythm of the pointer is much faster and is slightly rhythmically modified version of the current general alarm sound, but it still abides by the standard of alarms. So in terms of the auditory icon, specifically, we tested the cardiovascular alarm in our study, and this resembles a sort of lub-dub sound consisting of two pulses. So the auditory icon is basically meant to inform clinicians about specific emergency events that are happening so that they know where to look on the patient monitor. So the conventional alarm does not tell us what's wrong with the patient. So that's why the use of an auditory icon loosely described as a real world sounds that are easy to learn because they're strongly linked to their function and effective as localizable auditory icons can be helpful because they can actually inform the clinician about what's happening. So now getting into phase two, we actually recruited anesthesiology residents from Vanderbilt to participate in our study because they've had a lot of exposure and experience with the conventional alarm in real situations with real patients that are high stakes. So here on this slide, this shows a proportion correct in terms of background noise or background type for the CRM task. So this shows that in the operating room background noise and music condition, 
it significantly decreased the accuracy of correctly responding to tasks. So unlike the OR background noise only without music, which had significantly better results in terms of accuracy. Now this slide again shows the CRM task, but this time we're looking at response time with varied background type. So response times also significantly increased in the OR and music condition that when it was present. So basically when music was present, the participants took longer to respond to tasks as when there was compared to no music present. Lastly, in this figure, it shows again CRM task with proportion of no response to background type and the OR and music condition significantly increased the portion of no response. And I wanted to remind you that the music was volume normalized because we did not want speech masking or competition with volume. So the music was non-lyrical. So this shows that music, which was volume normalized, meaning that it was not loud compared to other noises present, led to a statistically significant worsen response. So participants did not even realize that there are sounds or people speaking to them. Scary, isn't it? So to see the remain, remainder of our impactful data, please read our upcoming paper. So while the findings of this study carry implications within clinical environments, they are not limited to the healthcare industry, but rather a variety of high consequence environments in which competing sounds create potential challenges for those performing tasks in high consequence domains, such as aviation and nuclear power. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Merrick. Good morning, everyone. I'll give everybody just a second um, to enter in our CME code 29060. Oops, sorry guys. Okay, so this morning I'm gonna take just a little pivot away from alarms and still talk about attention, but we're gonna talk about rounding order and how that can affect attention. So I'm going to talk about our observational study of clinician attentional reserves, or our OSCAR study. So some background, we know workload is increasing in the ICUs. Uh, our patient population is getting older, even pre-pandemic times, um, and getting sicker. And we're seeing that workload increase in our ICUs. On average, we see about 10 patients per rounding per intensivist. At VMC, that actually ranges anywhere from 8 up to 28 patients. Um, and rounds last about three hours. On average, um, we lose about eight minutes of rounding time from the beginning uh, of our rounds to the end per patient. So the patients at the end of rounds are getting less time dedicated to them. Uh, this has been proven across several studies. You usually lose about 30 seconds to a minute per patient as you're moving throughout rounds. Burnout, exhaustion, and medical errors are also concerns. That's across uh, medicine in general, but definitely in the ICU as well. Many factors in the ICU have been examined when it comes to this burnout and medical errors. And we wondered if we manipulated how we round, we can ameliorate some of these issues as well as allocate rounding time a little bit better. So we joined up with our neuroscience colleagues at Vanderbilt University to see if they could help us quantify some characteristics of a rounding team and maybe some changes that any intervention might have. They taught us uh, that an individual's ability to maintain focus on a task is limited and that performance decrements have been observed when the duration of task increases. So it's likely that our clinician's ability to focus is decreasing over time, at time as rounding is continuing or their attentional reserves are decreasing. We hypothesized, therefore, that clinician attentional reserves would be lower at the end of rounds than at the beginning, and that perhaps if rounding in order of decreasing patient acuity or a novel order, might preserve clinician attentional reserves. So if we rounded from sickest patient to least sickest patients, uh, we hoped that uh, perhaps we could preserve some of our attentional reserves. We recruited at two different sites, uh, Vandy and at Penn. At Vandy, we were in the neuro burn and sick you, and at Penn, just in their sick you. We recruited MPs, residents, and fellows for this study. We did conventional rounds on day one, so we saw patients um, uh, at bed one through, you know, bed up to 28, um, just essentially in numerical order or geographical order. And then we did novel rounding on day two. We didn't, we determined our novel rounding order based on SOFA scores. So we did the SOFA score um, that morning before rounds, um, listed the patient's sickest to least sickest, let our nurses know um, that the workflow would be changed and then followed according to that order. 
we used stop signal reaction testing or stop signal testing uh, before and after rounds to quantify attention. So uh, a little background on SST, it measures response inhibition which is the ability to restrain a response that becomes unnecessary or inappropriate. This is considered important for flexible behavior in a dynamic environment. It's, it's supported by the frontoparietal network, which is responsible for flexible decision-making across a wide variety of tasks. It's been used to look at response inhibition in smokers versus non-smokers, children with ADHD, um, those with addiction, even in athletes. And so it's been well established in the neuroscience field as a test of concentration and attention. And we chose this as a proxy for cognitive abilities because this kind of cognitive flexibility is crucial to the kind of decision-making used by physicians, especially during rounding um, and, and making plans for critical care. And while SST evaluates cognitive control overall, part of this control is attention and we're looking at attentional attrition. So this is an example of how we um, set up this task. We took our participants, placed them in an isolated room in the ICU, a quiet room, usually a call room of some sort. They had a laptop um, set up just like this. When the display showed a white arrow, this was considered a go trial and the participant was instructed to press the corresponding arrow left or right on the keyboard. On a subset of trials, the white arrow would turn to blue, um, which was considered a stop trial. And on stop trials, the participants were instructed to hold or arrest their response, not press a button. The stop signal reaction time, which is our surrogate for that attention, is the average of the latency of the inhibition response from the stop signal. And that stop signal is the blue arrow. This is a timeline essentially of how those trials worked. So um, in box A, you have a go trial. You see a white arrow would pop up. You'd have a little bit of time here to get the press in to get a correct trial. In B down here, we have the white arrow pop up and you see it switches uh, to blue about a half second or so. I'm sorry, it's, it's turning up gray here, but it was blue on our screen. And uh, that is your stop trial. You're not to press the button. So you wanna press the arrow before the time has lapsed to avoid missing the trial, but not too soon as to press before the color change. And then you have an incorrect trial, trials because you pressed when you're not supposed to. So you have to concentrate um, and have a fair amount of attentional reserves to be able to do this correct um, consistently. And it becomes harder and harder to do uh, the less attention you have. So this is just an example of the data that we gathered um, from this sort of task. I'm not gonna concentrate anything specific here. It's just to, to show you how much we can uh, gather from this sort of- That'll be a 50, that'll be- And uh, here are our results. Um, so this is site one and site two, Vanderbilt and Penn. And we're gonna concentrate on our stop signal reaction time, which is the surrogate for uh, attention. This is okay. in milliseconds um, and our- that'll be 50 novel uh, versus conventional here um, is shown at the bottom. You can see the statistic significance there. These negative numbers mean that the novel rounding showed less of a decrement. Time, sometimes attention. it's really slow, like the other day, it so, took us two hours to do a pull on. Yep. Um, but just remind everybody to mute if possible. Thank you. Um, that's yeah. just me. You're good. Rounding so this is what I did. So in order of uh, Sick hey, sorry, well. Merrick. Um, Melody, we're going to ask that you please uh, mute your phone and a reminder to everyone on there for the sake of our speakers and all of our listeners that everyone would please uh, mute. And thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so uh, again, this is just showing that if you round um, from sickest patient to least sickest patient, you, we showed uh, less of a decrement in attention as compared to rounding conventionally. We also took a survey on why we were doing this testing. We, test, we asked our nurses and physicians and our MPs as well on um, what they thought of uh, the novel rounding technique and they actually uh, enjoyed it. We were a little worried because it's such a disruption in workflow and it's sometimes a little bit hard to take a large rounding group around a large ICU um, that people may not, may not enjoy uh, doing this, but they actually found, they felt like it allocated time uh, better uh, so you're spending the longer time on the sicker patients and those sicker patients were actually getting care earlier in the day. So orders were placed earlier um, and uh, plans of action were in place earlier. Our future work is with Montefiore Hospital now in New Rochelle. It's a community hospital. So we'll be looking to see if we can apply the same technique outside a large academic center and get the same results. We'll also be adding in their non-ICU patients. So we'll be looking at the ICU as well as non-ICUs to see again if we get, get our same results there. All right. Thank you guys. Well, 
Thank you, Joe, Ali, and Merrick. Uh, we are going to switch uh, to Dr. Heidi Smith. And while I introduce her, um, Joe is going to be monitoring the chat and responding to some questions at the back end as well. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Heidi Smith. Heidi is an associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology in the Pete's Cardiac Division. And uh, Heidi is the proud recipient of a NHLBI funded grant to study sedation paradigms in children. And she's going to present to you just the background and some information about the mini men study, which we will be starting soon at uh, Vanderbilt and in the Children's Hospital. Heidi, over to you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So thank you so much for letting me have a few moments uh, to talk about our new trial maximizing the efficacy of goal-directed sedation to reduce neurological dysfunction in mechanically ventilated infants and children. So uh, my objectives today will just briefly review kind of some of the current sedation paradigms and how our study is going to look at some new thoughts on uh, sedation in the ICU culture and how that may impact uh, neurologic and behavioral outcomes. And only disclosures is uh, our new uh, funding through NHLVI. So the most common reasons for ICU admission in pediatric patients is both respiratory and myocardial failure requiring mechanical ventilation. And upwards of 90% of our patients requiring mechanical ventilation will also require a continuous sedation albeit over sedation, um, more recognized now in really the last five to 10 years in our uh, medical community. The majority of sedation in our population um, really has been based on benzodiazepine sedation, um, largely midazolam as continuous infusions. So um, these GABA agonists um, really have been used because they're hemodynamically stable, largely uh, cheap, easy to use, rather predictable. And at the time, we didn't really recognize that there might be any impact from the use of those medications. Um, and that any type of neurobehavioral abnormality is likely the cause of critical illness rather than something that we were doing to the patient. Um, but even 10 years ago, Jillian Colville and, co and uh, colleagues demonstrated that about a third of pediatric ICU survivors suffered from delusional memories and that those patients were more likely to have received benzodiazepine based sedation during their critical illness. Those patients were also most more likely to develop post traumatic stress symptoms, but that was prior to monitoring for delirium in the pediatric ICU and really any recognition that there was something we could do about it. And really, it's just been in the last five years, a study that we performed here at Vanderbilt, that we were able to demonstrate that in children receiving benzodiazepine sedation, that this was associated with a significantly prolonged PICU length of stay and also increased prevalence and duration of delirium. So delirium, again, um, many of us feel very comfortable with delirium because we're here at Vanderbilt, but acute brain resulting in disturbances in attention, awareness, and cognition. And again, those cardinal features of being able to uh, um, monitor or assess for inattention and uh, awareness. Um, so since the implementation of delirium monitoring in the pediatric ICU, we now recognize that at least 30% uh, of school-aged children suffer from delirium during critical illness rates of over 50% in infants and toddlers, and even higher rates over 60 to 70% of patients requiring mechanical ventilation, regardless of age, uh, suffer from delirium. We also know that delirium is independently associated with worse outcomes in pediatric patients, which is paralleling what you already know in adult patients. So affecting PICU length of stay, longer time on mechanical ventilation, leading to greater hospital costs, and even associated with higher mortality in a large um, multinational um, um, 
point prevalence study that Hani Traub had um, conducted. Now, what we don't know for sure and what is not clear in pediatric patients is the true relationship between delirium during critical illness and long-term cognitive impairment. Pilot studies have at least demonstrated that delirium during critical illness is associated with certain domains of learning up to a year following ICU discharge, such as problem solving and communication. And we also know that in all comers to the ICU, um, they have some level of developmental delay in about 19% of our pediatric population. But that can range from speech impairments to true significant um, cognitive and motor delay. But when you look at the same population a year out from ICU discharge, that degree of developmental delay increases to almost 60% again, ranging from those minor to more significant developmental delays. So we know that the critical illness itself is impacting neurobehavioral outcomes, um, but what we don't know is the play that delirium may or may not have. Well, this even further progressed by the FDA warning a couple of years ago of the possible role of anesthetics, particularly also benzodiazepines, in cognitive delay in children. This making us even more concerned about the way in which we sedate patients, not just in the operating room, but in the ICU, where arguably their, their exposure to these anesthetic type drugs is prolonged and extensive. But sedation in the PICU is likely unavoidable to some degree. Um, although our culture, we hope, can change to where patients are more alert and awake, but yet comfortable, um, it will be hard to ever get to a point where a toddler is sitting with an endotracheal tube in their mouth, just simply playing and being able to interact with their family. But we can get closer to that point. Um, but that begins, that, that's the concern, is how can we provide some degree of sedation in a matter which limits um, risk? So this really began to challenge us in what types of sedation strategies may impact outcomes, such as targeted sedation, which is actually not routinely used across the pediatric ICU. And this leads again to culture. This feeling of if the patient appears calm and comfortable, then are we not saving them from the ICU experience? If they appear to be sleeping, isn't that good? Um, but yet now we know that although a patient appears to be sleeping, is the brain really uh, experiencing healthy sleep? And then it becomes choice of sedation. Um, until about five years ago, we didn't really feel like we had a choice of sedation in the pediatric realm. Propofol not uh, consistently used because of the risk of PRIS. Um, so really benzodiazepine uh, um, administration became a necessity and despite the known risk until dexmedetomidine. Um, we all have felt much more co confident using dexmedetomidine over the past five years and this short acting alpha two agonist having other properties such as anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties um, may play a role um, in uh, improving outcomes for patients in the ICU. Um, that which you've already demonstrated in adults, um, 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 lending towards decreases in duration of mechanical ventilation and ICU stay, decreases in delirium prevalence, less costs, and even affecting rates of infection. So this now has led to benzodiazepine administration being one of the most modifiable iatrogenic risk factors for us uh, for poorer outcomes in the ICU setting. And again, with the actions of dexmedetomidine allows us to even further uh, understand the possible role of inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, and blood-brain barrier injury um, in, the, uh, um, in delirium, particularly even in kids. So our specific aims of this study is that we hypothesize that sedation of mechanically ventilated pediatric patients with an alpha-2 agonist dexmedetomidine versus GABAergic agents, uh, midazolam, will decrease daily prevalence of delirium, 
decreased duration of mechanical ventilation help us understand um, the role of delirium in um, mechanical ventilation. Also, that it's associated with better functional and behavioral recovery, uh, fewer symptoms of post-traumatic stress, and decreased incidence of cognitive impairment. And finally, um, that it is associated with reduced pro-inflammatory cytokines, markers of endothelial activation, and also blood-brain barrier injury. So we are going to randomize 372 consecutive patients requiring mechanical ventilation aged six months to 11 years to receive goal-directed sedation with either dexmedetomidine or midazolam. The study drug will be prepared with 10 levels of sedation with near equivalent drug effect as you increase each level of uh, sedation. Dexmedetomidine will be used up to two mics per kilo per hour, or yeah, per hour, sorry, and midazolam up to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per hour with the research team and the clinical team all blinded. So only the investigational pharmacy will know the randomization scheme. So we will implore a goal-directed sedation uh, using the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale as a marker of level of consciousness and also as a target for that goal-directed sedation by the medical team. Uh, we will also uh, incorporate pain assessment and management um, as a very integral part of our sedation protocol um, throughout the study. Delirium will be assessed twice daily using either the preschool or pediatric confusion assessment method for the ICU for up to 14 days while in the ICU. So even for those patients receiving the um, longest uh, um, duration of study drug, which will be 10 days, we will continue to monitor for delirium up to four days after that. So this is the pediatric CAM ICU, both the pediatric and preschool CAM ICU, both feature one is the same, assessing for acute change or fluctuating course of mental status. Um, moving on to inattention for the preschool CAM ICU, um, we use the Vigilance A, similar to the adult CAM ICU. Uh, you can also use memory pictures uh, for the pediatric CAM ICU, which we still have better pictures than the CAM ICU. Um, but for the preschool CAM ICU, again, because we're dealing with infants and toddlers, they can't uh, follow commands. We use this array of 10 pictures and mirrors, assessing for about that 10 seconds of uh, sustained attention. Feature three, altered level of consciousness is the same in both of the preschool and the pediatric CAM ICU. We're feature four in the older children. We still ask those four questions, but more developmentally appropriate, like is sugar sweet? instead of does a stone float on water, uh, followed by that two-step command. But in our preschool cam, we switch to dysregulated systems, looking for symptoms of unawareness of surroundings, inconsolability, and sleep-wake cycle disturbance. I think it's just really important for you uh, to visualize what we do in the ICU when it comes to delirium assessment. Our hope is to have children that are comfortable and calm uh, but still requiring mechanical ventilation. Here's the preschool CAM ICU, again assessing for that attention span of children. Um, and you get to see all these really cool, normal um, aspects to attention that we're looking Look for. Look at the picture. versus children with delirium. So this is one of our cardiac patients being assessed for yeah. attention. The RAS is zero. So if you look from the hallway, the patient looks alert and calm, but are they attentive? And you can see that he's just staring right through the cards the to the picture? ceiling. This patient had delirium. Now, a couple of days later, we reassess this patient. And now you can see He's still a RAS of zero. He's staring at our camera here. <laughs> but he is searching for those pictures. This is what a healthy brain wants to do, is interact with the environment, whether it's a toy, a family member, or a picture. Is this a truck? So our neuropsychiatric outcomes um, will include a screening at baseline, uh, hospital discharge, and then a very in-depth six-month in-person follow-up where we will look at functional status, 
post-traumatic stress symptoms in both parents and patients, maladaptive behaviors, and this becomes really important because disruptive, destructive, aggressive, or repetitive behaviors can actually affect a child's ability to not only perform in the school environment, but also affects their social interactions with their friends. So their ability to continue to have good social um, development as well can be impacted by these behaviors developing, and these can develop out of trauma um, or anxiety. And then obviously cognitive impairment that will be assessed by our psychology uh, colleagues uh, using standard age appropriate assessments at six months. And then finally biomarkers assessed uh, obtained on days one, three and five post randomization. Again, looking at our um, measures of cytokines, markers of endothelial and blood brain barrier uh, injury as our exploratory aim. Our uh, clinical trial, uh, we just were funded in September. We will actually begin enrollment in April of next year. We will continue enrollment through a year five with uh, finally our neurocognitive follow-up uh, finishing up and then ultimately our results. I just want to appreciate all of the help that so many people have given us, particularly my partner in crime, Pratik, but also Dr. Fuchs, Stacy Williams, Dr. Uh, Betters, and the rest of the pediatric team for sticking with me through now almost a decade of work that has led to this point. And a special thanks also to the department chair, Dr. Sandberg. Um, I don't say this lightly that I appreciate all the support that the entire department has given me um, to push this work forward. So thank you all for your time. Well, thank you, Heidi, and uh, thanks for the entire group for uh, your presentations and the active chat that is going on uh, simultaneously. We have a few minutes uh, for questions. So, um, Joe, if there are uh, questions that you have not yet tackled on the chat, feel free to respond to those. And if there are questions for Heidi, uh, we can start with those while uh, Joe is looking at all the lists of questions. All right, Joe, while uh, we're waiting for questions to come for Heidi, um, I have one question for you, which is which came to the chat separately, and that's from Dr. McAvoy. And the question is um, regarding one of your slides, which showed the uh, percentage correct with OR noise versus OR noise plus music, and it only showed a 40 versus 35%. So is there something that needs to be done to get the correct response greater than 90%, even when you don't have all that background sounds going on. No. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matt, for that question. So it, it is scary to think about 40% versus 35%. Realize that this is a very cognitively demanding environment such that, you know, even in, even in the OR and ICU, we're not often dealing with people constantly talking to us. This was a multi-talker display of one target and two to three maskers. So that'd be more akin to an emergency code situation where you know usually we have direct communication. Although we do a poor job with closed loop communication, we have masks on, you can't see people's mouths moving. And compared to aviation, we do a horrible job with closed loop communication. But this 40%, while it's arguably alarming, and it should be, that would be more towards uh, an emergency situation with multi-talker uh, setting. So the music aspect, we actually as a team had different hypotheses where Judy Edworthy thought it would be harmful and it turned out to be. As a musician, my bias um, was that it would be helpful because you feel energized, it helps focus. And there's arguments and that we're putting in our paper, which you can hopefully read if it gets accepted by human factors where we get into the music perception cognition literature of that. So while music was harmful, remember without words, not speech masking, volume normalized, not volume competition, I agree the 40% is concerning, but remember that it's not like we're barraged in a multi-talker environment 100% of the time. So we wanted to look at that as almost a worst case scenario, if you will, and we address the study design in our paper. Excellent. Okay, any other questions from the group? I've been trying to monitor ch the chat and I think we've answered most of the questions. Uh, 
There's a comment from Paul about turning down the music if it's getting too loud. That's just a comment. Uh, Heidi, there's a question uh, for you from uh, Dr. Blair about the use of guanfacine as an off-label adjunct for sedation. Yeah, I, I think that is an area, especially with uh, what you guys are already doing on the adult side, beginning to think about use of guanfacine. It clearly may play a role for our pediatric patients. And any time that we can give something preoperatively to begin kind of, again, this era of um, calmness um, and in the ICU, um, it, it becomes a really important piece. Anything to optimize patient comfort and anxiolysis other than use of these other medications that impact uh, the risk of delirium, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how guanfacine, uh, what role that will play. Absolutely. And Dr. Blair, sort of as a follow up on that, uh, we have just got an FDA IND for uh, the IV form of guanfacine with uh, partnership with Cumberland and uh, just got an NIH grant, uh, which Chris uses the PI for using IV guanfacine in a similar manner that right now clinicians use haloperidol in the ICU for delirium. So sort of a similar manner um, and it's a COVID supplement grant. So more about that soon. Any other questions for the speakers or any other comments? You can come off mute um, if you don't want to type. Pratik, I may have missed it. Um, uh, my, my signal was a little unstable for a second. R Raj had some comments and questions in there about basically, could we reroute all of the sound? And again, I may have missed that, but I, I, I'm curious, not only is that possible, but is that to the, uh, the group that presented on noise, it, has anyone done that? Or do we have any sense of the infrastructure cost it would be to allow patients to have quiet rooms? I mean, even on the floor, I think about the Alaris pump and the fact that we make it loud enough for a nurse to hear it outside of a closed door just seems like we're doing something really disruptive to sleep, even in the non-critically ill person. So I'm wondering, is there anything coming down um, the pike in addition to studies showing that the noise can be disruptive and harmful? Yeah, no, thanks. For, yeah, I can answer that. Um, thanks for your question. We are continuing to work on wearable technology. If you look at the chat, I typed a pretty long response um, to Raj about that. But um, our recent papers in the Journal of Clinical Monitoring and Computing um, and in the Journal of Auditory Perception and Cognition both go into wearable technology and multisensory integration, both especially from haptic or vibrotactile information to communicate physiology. And so we have some soundscape and uh, communication of physiology there, which, uh, which addresses that question in more detail and more time than I have right now. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, the speakers? Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Dr. Sandberg, any closing comments that you have? You've got three minutes. The final word, but I really enjoyed the chat and uh, it was a great set of presentations. So, uh, and uh, a lot of the side comments uh, really talk about some amazingly novel stuff that the department's doing. So it's, it's, it's just further demonstration of uh, the really cool work going on here. Congratulations to all the speakers and everybody else who got mentioned on the side. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Friday and weekend. It's gorgeous weather. Be careful out there. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.